A door slams in another room, shaking the house around Joan and Martin Pistorius. Martin, in a coma since he was 12, sits still in his wheelchair, his eyes aimlessly listing across the now silent room. His mother wrings her hands, trying to choke back waves of grief and fear. The light seems to dim around her, as darkness, cold and lonely, creeps closer and closer toward her. Between sobs, she looks up at Martin, their gazes meeting. You must die, she says in a low, pleading voice. You have to die. Like a lightning strike, her words pierce Martin's heart, but they shouldn't. The doctors assured them that he was gone, that the boy sitting in the wheelchair wasn't their son anymore. But no, he can hear her every word, clear as thunder. This is the story of Martin Pistorius, the ghost boy who disappeared into a waking coma with no way to tell anyone that he was back. How could you convince someone you were awake if the only thing you could move is your eyes? How did people look at him every day for 12 years and never see that he was always awake? On New Year's Eve 1975, a baby is born in a South African hospital. Martin lets out a wailing cry, and tears well up in his parents' eyes as they behold their firstborn son, a fire of love lit in their hearts. By age 12, Martin was a natural whiz with electronics and circuitry. He constructed an alarm system from his room to ensure his younger brother and sister, David and Kim, didn't interfere with his Lego. He built a reset button for his parents' PC, and his affinity for electrical engineering was so apparent and comprehensive that his mother, Joan, even allowed him to repair a wall plug socket. But then, one day in January 1988, Martin came home from school with a sore throat and never returned to classes. Little by little, he stopped eating, started sleeping all day long, and began struggling to walk through growing pain. As he stopped using his body, it began to weaken, and as his body weakened, so too did his mind. Doctors weren't able to diagnose the cause. Joan quit her job as a radiographer to take care of him at home when he wasn't being tested in hospital, while his father, Rodney, started working longer and longer hours at his mechanical engineer job that he was barely home enough to see any of his children. So, it was decided that Martin would stay at a care home during the day and come home each night at 8. And there, Martin stayed as his condition worsened and then stabilized into what everyone could see a waking coma. Fax went first, then he started losing grasp on routines like watering a bonsai tree he had been caring for, and then faces disappeared. Joan gave him a frame of family photos to remember who was who and played a video of his father every day, hoping that some familiarity would help him hold on to a piece of himself. Martin's fingers and toes curled into gnarled claws as he slipped into a comatose state. He wasn't able to eat or drink on his own, so his parents would wake him up to spoon feed him his meals, and he would swallow instinctively. Medical staff ran tests of all kinds, but couldn't find anything wrong with him. So perhaps, they thought, it might be psychosomatic, that it was all in his head. But as Martin began to dehydrate in a psychiatric unit, and no amount of pleading was able to coax him to drink, they knew that this was something unique, something they'd never seen before. Martin had some kind of degenerative neurological disorder. He was treated for tuberculosis and cryptococcal meningitis, but doctors were never certain as to what was causing Martin's illness. And without knowing what caused it, they couldn't treat it. The only thing anyone could do was to maintain his basic quality of life and wait for him to die. Nothing could stop what was to come. Martin hated hospitals and care homes. He just wanted to be home with his family. But by then, his body was so weak that it was a Herculean effort just to turn his head. His speech deteriorated, and after a year in and out of hospitals, with doctors poking and prodding his body to find just a shred of a clue that might lead them to a treatment, he spoke his last words to his mother. Went home. And then, he woke up. As Martin's mind rose back to the surface, he experienced something of a second selfhood. He moved from nothing into a mind and finally into a body. But whose body? He'd forgotten what it was like to be a mind in something. He looked down at his own feet and realized that they were his own. His sense of time was hazy and his consciousness slipped in and out of clarity. 
Nelson Mandela swearing in as first president of South Africa in 1994 appears blurred in his memory, but Princess Diana's death in 1997 pierces through the fog. In some ways, being awake was worse than being nothing. Martin's mind was back, but his body still suffered from the illness that had brought him to such dire straits. He still couldn't speak. He could move his eyes, but shifting his head to look at anything was a Herculean effort. Looking at him, you'd see the same young man, laying wordlessly in the same hospital bed as he laid in the day before. Even as Rodney dressed and undressed him, Martin wanted to reach out and say that he was back. But as each day passed and his father continued to fail to see, Martin resigned himself to his own waking prison. He would never escape. Martin's days were spent laying in the care home, watching as time passed by, observing the length of the shadows in the room, waiting for nurses and caretakers to come see him, slogging through reruns of Barney left on idle on the little TV in the corner of his room. Tormented by the isolation and with nothing to stimulate him other than the meaningless dribble of children's television, he retreated into his imagination. His mind became a palace where he could escape. He ventured into worlds of ants crawling across the floor, warring against other tribes, the only witness to a world of magic inside his own mind. His palace protected him from more than just the torment of Barney the Purple Dinosaur, but the torment he suffered at the hands of his caregivers as well. You think you can get out of eating just by puking up? A nurse berates Martin. She ignored his gag reflex, shoving a spoonful of food and vomit back into his mouth. He swallows, praying that she won't do it again. This he endured, and worse. When you're all alone, with no way to communicate, there's no one to advocate for your body autonomy, for your rights. Through all of it, he just prayed that someone, anyone, would see him. And then, she saw him. Martin suffered from what we've come to call locked-in syndrome, or LIS. It's like your mind is locked inside of your body, as if it's on house arrest. You can look out the windows, but no one can see you inside. Martin's illness would have been defined as classical LIS, characterized by total bodily paralysis. But you're still able to blink and move your eyes vertically, but not horizontally. Your sense of hearing and cognitive functions remain intact as well. You can hear, see, and understand but you can't move or say anything to anyone. Incomplete LIS, on the other hand, is basically the same, but you're not totally paralyzed. Take Rom Huben, for example, who was put into a coma-like state for 23 years following a car crash which deprived his brain of oxygen for several minutes. He could still move his right hand and now communicates via a keyboard. Lastly, there's the total immobility form of LIS defined by complete paralysis and loss of eye movement. Like in the previous forms, your cognitive function stays, but you're totally immobile. Most people with LIS, regardless of the form, aren't able to chew, swallow, speak, make facial expressions, or move anything below their eyes. That said, they can hear, think, and reason, understand what is being said to them, as well as maintain their sleep and wake cycles. What causes LIS, though? Martin's doctors told his parents that they couldn't be sure what was causing his deterioration, but, generally speaking, LIS is triggered by damage to the brainstem, specifically in a part called the pons, a key neuronal pathway between cerebrum, spinal cord, and cerebellum, and when it's damaged, messages from your brain to your muscles can be disrupted, resulting in paralysis. Damage to the pons also affects areas of your brain in charge of facial expression and speech. The problem with brain stuff is that anything that affects the brain can trigger a cascade of events, causing issues in other parts of our body. While Rodney took care of him physically and constantly advocated for him, Joan, who couldn't bear to watch her son disappear into himself, gave in to despair. In her eyes, this was her failure. If she loved him more, if she tried harder, one way or another, after so many years of guilt and shame, she wasn't able to be there for him anymore. One day, after a massive fight, Rodney stormed out of the house and Joan was left with nothing but guilt and her son who reminded her of her deepest failure and shame. She turned to him, her eyes welling up with tears, and pleaded, You must die. You have to die, she said. The words stung like hornet stings, but as Martin laid there, stewing in his mother's words, he felt a great compassion building up in his chest. He was the ghost boy, a shadow of the son that she'd loved and cared for, and for all she knew, he was gone, never to return. For all anyone knew, Martin had died years ago. 
He began to think maybe it would be better if he had. His father wouldn't have to take care of him physically while also working long hours at his job. His mother wouldn't have to be reminded of her ghost of a son anymore. Maybe it would be better, he thought. Because no one knew what was wrong with Martin, no one could help him. But worse, no one knew that he was even there anymore. People stopped looking. That is, until she arrived. Her name was Virna, and she visited the hospital offering aromatherapy treatments. Her presence was a small gift to Martin and his fellow patients in the care home. She would also offer massage therapy, touching his catatonic limbs, soothing out knots, and pushing out tension. It was a small shred of dignity that Martin hadn't been afforded until that moment. It gave him one tiny reason not to give up on life forever. If she could treat him, a man she'd never spoken to, with dignity, then maybe he was worth something. Virna was the first person to treat him like another person, not as an object of pity. Because of this, he promised himself he'd look her in the eyes. Martin's head was like a cinder block, and moving his head to make eye contact with people was a nightmare. Not just that, but since he laid in a hospital bed, he was rarely at eye level with people. So until Virna arrived, he'd given up on eye contact for people who look but never see. Virna looked at him properly, like no one had done for a long time. And when she looked at him, she could see he was looking back. His eyes locked with hers, something she didn't think he was capable of. But when she suggested to the staff at the care home that he might be lucid, they responded with skepticism. He was considered the lowest IQ individual in a home where the only entry requirement is an IQ of 30 or lower. Eventually, Virna went beyond the care home and spoke to Martin's parents directly, who agreed to have him tested to see if he was still awake inside. So early July 2001, 13 and a half years after he fell into his coma, Martin's parents brought him to the Center of Augmentative and Alternative Communication at the University of Pretoria to assess his cognitive ability. Martin met Shakila, a speech therapist, who put him through tests like identifying a ball and a dog on a sheet of multiple images, and identifying specific words. The problem for Martin, though, his ability to move his head was still severely limited, and pointing to things with his eyes was difficult. If he didn't get this right, if he didn't pass, then no one would see him ever again. Another speech therapist, Yasmin, as Martin's heart raced, asked him to identify the word mum. He panicked. He didn't know what the word mum looked like. He remembered the sound image, the memory of the word in his mind, but the information for written language had corroded after 13 years of disuse. They swapped tests, giving Martin a small dial display with more images, as well as a head switch nestled between his neck and shoulder. Shakila and Yasmin explain that they'll ask for a specific image, and a pointer should move slowly across the screen, and Martin is to hit the dial whenever the cursor reaches the image in question. They begin the test, asking him to stop on a water tap. Martin watches as the pointer arcs across the display. Inching around the little dial, the cursor creeps slowly toward the tap. The pointer, after what feels like aeons, falls like an avalanche onto the picture of the tap. With all the strength he can muster, Martin drives all his power into his neck, wrenching his head against the switch. The cursor stops on the tap. Good, Martin, someone says. Now that it was clear that Martin was lucid, they had to come up with more robust methods of communication beyond simple eye movements and the flexing of one of his hands. Eye contact wasn't enough. He'd have to use symbols. His problem now wasn't communicating full stop, but being limited to communicating specific things. With the use of symbols, his caregivers would have to anticipate his needs. If he didn't have a symbol for a specific request or response, he wouldn't be able to communicate it. Martin and his family learned more about the use of pointing and blinking at symbols, and using speech-generating devices and computer programs to communicate. Shakila recommended a device called Macaw, a black box with a grid of squares featuring different symbols and words. It's very similar to the device that Stephen Hawking used. She hits a button, and a robot voice responds, I am tired. I can see from the way your eyes travel that you can identify the symbols we ask you to, and you are trying to use your hand to do the same. Wouldn't you like to be able to tell someone that you're tired or thirsty? Shakila asked. 
Before he could use the macaw, though, Martin needed to figure out how he would navigate its UI, similar to how we learn how to navigate the UIs of our smartphones. It might take him a little more practice to get the hang of it, though. Shakila identified two different tools that Martin might be able to use. A lolly switch, which he could operate by curling his hand around the rectangular box and squeezing his fingers, and a wobble switch, a joystick-looking tool that could be activated many different ways. Martin was excited, but the box itself only carried 250 words. It was leagues better than what he was able to do before. But imagine picking only 250 words to speak with. The box was also expensive, and money had been tight ever since Martin's condition deteriorated. How could he ask his parents to spend even more on him? The devaluation of the South African currency threw another wrench in the works, and Martin needed to give up on the macaw. Fortunately, they opted instead to use a computer and a specialized program to communicate. Martin was still worried about picking the right one, but his mother assured him that they would keep getting new programs until they found the perfect one. The two of them worked together on the program, adding in word after word until he had his voice. Then, one Christmas morning, Martin, his parents, called his sister Kim over the computer. She smiled as he slowly typed out his message. Hello Kim, happy Christmas. The ghost boy was coming back to life. There's a lot more to Martin's story, but today he works as a web developer and lives in the UK with his wife Joanna, who he married in 2013, and his son Sebastian, who was born healthy and happy in 2018. Martin's story isn't inspiring because recovery from illness is inspiring in and of itself. Martin is more than his illness, and he isn't a tool that able-bodied people get to use to feel inspiration or pity. Martin is inspiring not because he endured suffering, but because he emerged from his suffering with his compassion and love intact. Even as words disappeared from his lexicon, as he forgot the faces of the people he cared about, and as his mother wished for his death, the only thing that remained was a boundless love for humanity. At a TED Talk he gave in 2015, Martin mentioned a time in which a man smiled at him while he waited for his father in their car. He said that, The smallest shred of human decency, of dignity, brought him up from his darkest place. So, as you go about your day, try to do what Martin always wanted to do. To look. And actually see. Based on our last video, we put a poll on Twitter asking, do you currently own or want a robot vacuum? And looks like about half of you said yes, with one viewer commenting, I don't own one, which might be good because the topic may be about how it'd be harmful for me. Well, if you consider having your picture taken and leaked all over social media harmful, then I'd say yes. Click the video on your screen now to find out what's really going on.